Women have learned to value the alpha male because the alpha male did the best protecting of not only her, but the children. Her job was to protect the children. Her job was to be willing to die for the children. His job was historically to be willing to die for her and the children. Um, but no one's job was to be willing to die for the man uh, living. Mm. His job was to die for others. And so this is deep-seated in every uh, animal we have this. 85% of animals, um, the female um, reproduces with the alpha male. Then we were also told that before women started sharing the economic responsibilities to a greater degree, uh, we were told that we should uh, be willing to sacrifice our lives, um, you know, c uh, climbing up a corporate ladder, being becoming um, and 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 um, giving up jobs that we really love to do for jobs that paid more, um, or and so we learned to be disposable either in war or in the workplace. Now, when men start asking to be paid attention to because of psychological challenges they have, that doesn't make women feel protected. And so there's very, there's an underlying biological propensity on the part of both women and men to not be okay with men saying what their challenges are in order to mm. be able to be respected by women or by other men, you have to put on a mask of invulnerability not uh, because we knew that the people who went to war, uh, if you were in boot camp in war and you were and somebody said something anti-Semitic or, or uh, you know, um, racist, and you said, you know, um, officer, um, sergeant, sir, you know, that seemed very racist to me or very anti-Semitic to me. And your the response to you would be, uh, oh, isn't that sweet? Anti-Semitic, racist. Oh, we're going to have a little pouting boy here. And why did he respond that way? Because your purpose was to be disposable as part of the war machine. Uh, the war machine did not work well with squeaky wheels. The war mm -hmm. machine worked well where everybody just forgot about their own feelings, their own fears, and just were willing to work and be disposable. And, and women gave us the same message. Uh, Lois Lane had no interest in Clark Kent who expressed feelings. She only had interest in Superman. Now, oh, once, <laughs> once she found out he was Superman, then she thought she could add to him um, by ha helping him express feelings, but zero interest in the person who expressed feelings without first being Superman. And, wow. you know, and you see this in you know, movie after movie and theme after theme and in real life. If you go to a party and you say in the real life, um, you know, let's say you're in college, and the woman says to you, you know, um, you know, what are you planning to do? And you say, you know, I just love kids. I'd like to be maybe either a kindergarten school teacher or, you know, if I marry somebody and we have children, I'd love to be. I think I'd be a great full time dad. Um, well, you know, is, is you're going to be making some significant money that way? Um, oh, well, it doesn't really make that much difference. We can live in a fairly you know, modest place as long as, you know, the children have love. Oh, that's a really good idea. Yes, indeed. And then she goes back for a drink and sends a journalist your way to talk to the journalist about it. <laughs> it doesn't come back uh, to you. Um, and you know, she asks, you know, well, well, where are you living now? Oh, I'm living in my parents' basement because I really want to, you know, sort of um, do some things that are really useful. I'm really helping the homeless and doing things like that. That is really sweet. Uh, bye. Um, you know, and so <laughs> men get this message in a thousand different ways, and and this is not to this is not blaming women because women have learned to value the alpha male because the alpha male did the best protecting of not only her, but the children. Her job was to protect the children. Her job was to be willing to die for the children. His job was historically to be willing to die for her and the children. Um, but no one's job was to be willing to die for the man uh, living. Mm. His job was to die for others. And so this is deep seated in every uh, animal, we have this. 85% of animals, um, the female um, reproduces with the alpha male. So a very fascinating story of, of this is what happens with buck elks. Uh, so the female buck elk wants to, um, she finds which male buck elk has the biggest rack. 
um, and she wants to have um, the, her sex and reproduction with um, with him because she'll he'll be able to protect her from unwanted suitors and be able to protect the ch protect the um, children from predators. And so she finds the rack with the el the buck elk with the biggest rack, and she uh, has sex with him, and they reproduce. And then that, but that buck elk, in order to get that biggest rack, has to uh, it, he has exhausted. 30% of his minerals, his calcium, and his nutrients. So if he doesn't get rid of that rack immediately, um, he is likely to die before winter sets in um, because he doesn't have enough time to replenish his, uh, his nutrients. So the, 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 the motto of that is that the male weakness is his facade of strength. What it took mm. for him to be that super alpha male was the exhaustion Oof. of everything that really made him strong. But it wasn't the, the, the concern of the female to have him be reveal the weaknesses that he was feeling as he was getting the big rack. It was the concern of her to find the male with the biggest rack so she could protect her children. And, that's the, and that goes through all uh, animals, from insects right on up through humans. And so we have something very deep that we're dealing with here, and which is why we need to not be blaming women or blaming ourselves, um, but something that for the first time in human history, um, in, in the 53 largest developed nations, um, there's enough mastery of survival in the middle and upper middle class that we can ask, we can have different senses of purpose other than just dying to have, have the other sex survive, uh, survive. And that's what we really need to aim for now. Um, yes, is masculinity toxic? Lots of portions of masculinity are toxic. Lots of portions of masculinity are not toxic. Um, but the result of the toxicities do not come from male privilege and male power. They come from male powerlessness. Wow. That's absolutely powerful, man. There's so there's so much, man. I mean, we're just like we can literally have five different podcasts for five hours each about everything that we've even said from the introduction. So I I, I had a way I wanted to go, but you lit you took the conversation a whole different direction. But I want to I want to stay where you're taking this conversation, because I kid you not, um, I literally what you described about Clark Kent and Lois Lane. I literally had a video about that. And everything that you described, I talked about it in the video, and and the, and the themes is exactly similar. What you see in almost every single animal, as you shared, and what you see especially in society, is that you know when it comes to male desirability, there are certain skill um, that women desire. You know, and these are usually masculine skills: power, dominance, strength, assertiveness, confidence, competence, initiative. All these skills are masculine skills that women desire, but what, what, what's never talked about is what does it take to get these skills, right? You want, to be, you want somebody on the top of the hierarchy in regard to the workplace, but what did that man have to do in order to get to the top? You want somebody who's driven, who's ambitious, but what, how did that change this individual? And so one of the biggest things that I saw was that so many times the things, you know, that society would label men for being evil about were the very things society needed men to do for society to thrive. And one of the things I thought about was um, when it comes to big predators, you know, like hu human civilization, whether it was saber tooth tigers, whether it was, you know, you know, snakes in the, in the Amazon, wherever it was. There were large predators that could kill us. And so what ended up happening was that what you needed was strong, powerful, fearless men to go and fight and kill these big predators to keep us safe. And so when you have generation after generation of, like you said, disposable um, warriors that you call to keep us safe and to cultivate this world and to battle these predators, what is going to become of them? How are they going to be molded? How are they going to be shaped? And so what I see and what I've noticed is that society benefited from the machine that they made men to be. 
We wouldn't be here without all the men who sacrificed their lives, blood, sweat, and tears, you know, to be able to civilize society from just a nature perspective. I'm not even getting into, you know, wars and things like along those lines. But then after that, now, after using these men to be these war machines to civilize society, now we want to demonize them for what we've required them to be. Yes. Yes. And so to me, what you described is something that I was thinking about the other day. And, 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 and what it seems to me is that there is not much compassion to what men are going through. And you made a great point that what happens so many times in the world is that we understand that women and children deserve to be protected. We understand that if a woman is crying on the side of the road, there's something wrong, and then we as society must come around her to love her, to support her, to lift her up. But when we see men on the side of the road crying, there is no sympathy that's elicited towards individual. Absolutely. We tell that guy to get back up and to make it happen. Mm -hmm. There's no talk show for men to cry and to share about their feelings and what's going on. We have no sympathy for this man. And so what I've been seeing is that when it comes to so many of these men who are struggling, especially in today's world, there is absolutely no sympathy for the for what they're dealing with. And we as a society have not come taken responsibility by saying we needed you to be these machines and now you're suffering because of it. Absolutely right. There's so many levels of um, addressing that question. Um, one is, you know, the on the, on the pure uh, empathy level. Um, we know that men um, die, five, it used to be 5.2 years sooner in the last uh, year or two with COVID, it's increased to 5.4 years sooner than women do. And the um, and we, we know that we just haven't heard this 40% um, greater increase in life um, expectancy or decrease in life expectancy for men. Um, you ha We haven't heard that because it's men that are hurting. Um, and so we, uh, so that type of absence is there. There's so many things that are going on simultaneously, and I'll, I'll address two very important dimensions of that. 